Today is January 15th, 2018, and you're listening to Human Factors Cast episode 73. Today on Human Factors Cast, we're going to be breaking down some of the tech from CES 2018. We're going to also be talking about some algorithms that prevent death, how Isaac Asimov is impacting self-driving cars, and more. Human Factors Cast is that ballistic missile incoming for Hawaii. So go ahead and uh, eat all the food at the buffet because it starts right now. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. Howdy, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the buffet. Okay, so that comment was probably a little bit confusing to you. Uh, maybe I should explain. So over the weekend... <laughs> that would be wonderful, but that was pretty funny, no matter what. I, I know. Over the weekend, there was this thing that we will talk about in just a minute. But during this whole ordeal... Um, uh, uh, somebody messaged their dad basically and said, "So what? What was it like? What was happening?" And he basically said, "I was at I was at brunch and everybody basically went hysterical and exited the building, and I just went up to the buffet and cleared the place out." Nice. <laughs> <laughs> There's no better reaction to a ballistic missile than to just eat all the food. Oh my gosh! No kidding. All right. So Blake, what's going on with you, buddy? Oh, man. So I see in the banter here I have Apple Watch, but unfortunately, due to my running around, I actually did not open up the box today. What? But I'll tell the story anyway. I'll tell the story. I'm going to do it after the podcast and after the meeting, after the podcast, whatever. Okay. But uh, Elisa's dad, my, my girlfriend's dad, he had recently upgraded his Apple Watch, and so he didn't know what to do with his old one, and he actually sent it to me. And for anybody who doesn't know or longtime listeners do know, I'm pretty big into fitness and fitness tracking is something big coming from the Apple Watch, especially through some of the stories we've talked about. So I was hoping to talk about, you know, the UI or some of the apps that I was like playing with or something like that. Um, but I'll have to wait for that till next week because I haven't even opened the box. I don't, I don't even know what I've been doing today that I haven't opened that box. Big. So that's kind of toast for me. Nick, what have you been up to? Blake's a busy boy. I Okay, so I've been up to a couple things. Now, this one I had on the banter from last week, but I really want to talk about it. So there is – um, so th- R- Disney does these marathons and half marathons and 5K runs uh, at, the, at their theme parks. So you basically uh, pay the fee to – do the run and you get to go through the park sometimes or downtown Disney or whatever. And, and, um, that's all great. But for those of us who can't participate in these events, and the reason why you'd want to participate in these events is obviously because all the proceeds go to charitable causes. And also you get these swag medals for actually doing these runs. Uh, I unfortunately can't be in Florida this year to do the, um, Dark Side 5K Star Wars marathon or, or, or half marathon. So instead, they they have this option for um, people who want to participate but are remote, and they call this the virtual half marathon. So basically, what happens is that you have to sort of run this half marathon. That's thirteen point one miles, uh, and they give you they give you several months to do it. So like even if you were a beginner runner like me, like not even can't even pace you know 16 minute mile uh they they still will give you the thing as long as you can show that you have at least run this long right and and for me it's been just trying really hard to make like one mile at a time um and i i thought it was a really cool sort of uh opportunity to still give to these charitable causes and get the swag medal but do it um wherever you like now they encourage you to do this in front of like a a star wars movie or something to make you feel like you're actually running in the environment or whatnot but but i just thought it was a cool thing that's pretty awesome i had never heard of virtual half marathons and when you put on here last week i really wanted to know and i didn't know that they actually did uh like disney half marathons that would actually be fun to go and do because I am not a runner, but my girlfriend certainly is, and this would be one that would be enjoyable, although in Florida, I would probably melt. Maybe, but they do do them uh, over here on our side uh, at Disneyland, so maybe maybe we could plan something once uh, 
you know, we're a little bit all bore in running ship shop shape. Yeah, let's do it, man. <laughs> That'd be a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, so I have a couple other things on here. So Electric Dreams, have you heard of this? Yes. So oh, I sent gosh. this to uh to actually my girlfriend's dad as soon as I saw that it came out. I haven't watched it yet, but I've got it queued up to go. But do you want to tell the listeners a little bit about it? Oh boy, I like it so far. Um it it's uh it's really scratching an itch that Black Mirror season four didn't do for me. Um and if you're unfamiliar, this is Electric Dreams is Amazon Prime's answer to Netflix's Black Mirror, and it also kind of investigates how technology same kind of vein right how technology can run amok and and all this other stuff and and um but it's based on short stories by philip k dick so of course you know it's going to be good for science fiction e stuff but i i gotta say man the first two episodes have um have really really resonated with me so the first episode obviously everyone knows i'm a vr nut so uh it's not easy to impress me with vr stuff um, but they managed to do it because they, they take this route, which I'm not going to spoil. There's no spoilers here. Let's be clear. They, they take this route that, that kind of explores it in a way that I hadn't necessarily thought of before. And it was really intriguing to me. Um, and the second episode investigated what would happen sort of if the world was nuked and all that remained were self-sustaining automatic Amazon factories that still delivered to people. Whoa, that's intense. So I got to say, man, these first two episodes, they start really strong. I I can't vouch for the rest of the season yet, but I plan on watching some more this week. Uh, Definitely something that I I will report back on. Um, and uh, there is there is something that we're going to be... Do- the last thing on my list is there's going to be something that Blake and I are doing this weekend together, which I'm very excited about. I'm wondering whether or not we should say what it is and then uh, kind of tease it or if we should just leave it for next week. Uh, I think what we'll do is we'll post about it a bunch on social media while we're going to said event. Okay. And go from there. How's that? All right. So look for us on uh, on all of our social media channels and we'll even post on the Slack too. Hey, look at that. That's a great transition. Speaking of Slack, I want to shout out to a couple communities uh, or our, our Human Factors Cast community on on Slack. Wow, messing up tonight. That's okay. Um, so Tuan left us his 2018 predictions. We asked for predictions in our Slack and wanted to crowdsource it from you guys. Uh, so they think that autonomous car testing is going to be presumably uh, more involved this year. Cryptocurrency is going to go up 0.000. 1%, um, no, cause, because no one knows which one to use. There will be new glucose monitoring devices that simplify daily tracking. Cybersecurity hopefully improves for personal use in corporate applications. And uh, he asks, does human factors play a role in success of cybersecurity? So... I want to say 110% it does, yeah. but maybe maybe I'm misunderstanding the question because that's like uh, when I think of cybersecurity, maybe if something goes wrong, I'm kind of thinking of the processes and steps that need to be in place once something does happen, whether oh, it's sure. at, like the algorithm level or at the, if it gets to the human level. So I see a little bit of human factors in there at least. Yeah, and I think it also gets at it from the preventative side as well. Because if you if you if you can inform people not to fall for phishing scams or what to look for signs to look for, I think that's a human factors issue as well. Oh, that's an even better point. Yeah, the upfront. Yeah, and I have to say, Twan, you like had some really interesting um, predictions, especially with cryptocurrency, because I totally understand. He leaves a comment in here about no one which no one knows which one to use, and that's yeah. definitely something that's a big problem. Um, yeah. We'll see. And funny enough about the glucose monitoring devices, I can't remember the lady's name. I'll try and tweet it out or put it in Slack for you. Um, but she had actually been hacking and putting together different glucose devices that would be kind of off the market because apparently companies that are like really big into building these monitors are not meeting some of the needs of their users. So she decided to like grab a collective of people uh, to try and build their own kind of glucose and some uh, some other kind of blood lipid monitoring systems. So I'll try and find her um, her handle for you. She's interesting to follow, especially when it comes to this monitoring technology. But thanks for sharing, man. 
Yeah, and thank you for writing in your predictions. If you guys have predictions for 2018, feel free to join us on our Slack and write those in there. We're always happy to hear from you guys and share them on the show. We also want to shout out to Brittany for joining the Human Factors Cast Slack channel. We're glad to have you. If you guys want to be like Brittany, uh, we will post the link to the Slack in the show notes so you can join us over there. We're trying to facilitate some good discussion among the community and... and, uh, it's, it's going pretty well so far. It's a little quiet over the holiday, but I, I think we'll ramp up here pretty soon. All right, Blake, I'm ready to jump into the news. Are you ready to jump into the news? Let's do it, man. Let's we got some juicy ones. get into it. Yeah, we do. This is the part of the show all about human factors news. This is where we talk about everything related to the field of human factors. This could be anything from artificial intelligence, virtual reality, automation, design, whatever it is, as long as it relates to the field of human factors, it is fair game. Blake, we alluded to it earlier. What do we got up first this week? Yep, here we are. All right, so last week, a lot of us know that phones across Hawaii received an emergency alert about a ballistic missile threat inbound. And according to state officials, it was merely a mistake caused by human error. U.S. reps, Hawaii's governor, and the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency all took to Twitter to confirm that the alert was indeed a false alarm. However, it took a whole 38 minutes before a second alert was was to reach people's phones, also confirming that this for the first alert was indeed a mistake. So it turns out the mistake was made during a standard procedure at the changeover of a shift, and an employee accidentally pushed the wrong button. Now, it's, it's, it may seem kind of insane that we're, we're sitting here talking about somebody pressing a wrong button and it shooting out a ballistic missile threat, but I think last year or the year before, Nick, one of the two, we had something similar happen where I think it, I think it had to do with either a Navy ship or something like that, where somebody had pressed the wrong button and ship wide, they had like a missile uh, inbound threat type of thing. Um, but this is just another case where even something as simple and apparently standard a standard procedure can go pretty wrong for a whole lot of people or a whole entire country. Yeah, and we say it's just a button, but it's a really important button. Like, and the fact that this took thirty what thirty eight minutes. Would you say? It yeah, was 38, 38 minutes. minutes just to get that second alert to phones. So you can imagine people were probably in hysteria for 38 minutes. And I'd be curious to hear any sort of uh, any sort of testimonies from people who were in Hawaii at the time. What kind of their their eyewitness account of what was going on? Because I can't even imagine this. If I saw that, I I would be like freaking out calling everybody I knew and loved and saying my goodbyes like cuz you're on an island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean there's no way you can escape that like this is and and the uh the governor even said this was an inexcusable mistake and like we also said this is attributed to human error now Human error, as we as human factors practitioners know, practitioners that know, we know that that is because of some sort of design choice behind the scenes. Why was it so easy to press that button? What what instructions were there that made that button the one that they pressed instead of the fake one? You know what I mean? Like there's just so much stuff here that that is a human factors issue that we can kind of parse through and talk about. Yeah, and the one thing that I, because I, I don't really, I don't have cable, so I'm not watching the news, and I only kind of pay attention to stories that uh, that I read, but I wonder what the perception is if, there, if people are really hammering on the human error aspect, because I've seen across Twitter, like, from people like Don Norman and other, like, big design heads, that really, like, okay, this is attributed to human error, but at the end of the day, it's like you're saying, this is a design problem. Like, if... Uh, I don't know. One of the one of the heuristics from Nielsen Norman is something to the effect of if an action has dire consequences, you need to inform the user of those consequences. So if you're going to delete something, getting that pop up that says, do you really want to delete this? And then you ensure, yes, I do. You would think that there must be something for like a button that, you know, triggering triggering a message across an entire state that the ballistic missile threats inbound would have something like that in place but maybe not maybe it's simply that if anybody ever presses it hey we've really got a problem right and and i i suspect that there is some sort of messaging system where you actually have to type in what you want to say and then press the send button and what they do is i i i 
I suspect, or I, I at least think, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, that it was during a, um, you said that it was during a shift change, but I wonder if it was also during a drill that they sort of have to, you know, put it like, here's what would happen if a ballistic missile was coming in. All right, we're going through the motions. We type in incoming missile, uh, red alert, whatever, and then press the fake send button that's right above the real send button, you know, and it was just as simple as that. Like, who who knows, really? But um, I'm just reading here some of the uh, eyewitness testimony. Uh, basically, let's see here. 38 minutes later, uh, the alert said came through, said it was fake, fake, but in the meantime, nobody knew what was going on. Uh, let's see here. People were screaming, you have to shut the doors, time is running out, said Austin Coleman, a University of Hawaii at Manoa student. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of like really almost almost heartbreaking stuff to read about this because again 40 minutes where you think you're going to die it's yeah just... and it's a it's a scary thing right because we like there's there's we live in a world where this kind of stuff is possible and can happen i mean to the point where we have these kind of systems in place that this mistake was able to be made and i mean it um, would be one thing if there were not tensions in the world between certain countries um but I, I mean, and especially in this time, yeah, it's just it's crazy that something like this can happen. This false false alarm. Yeah, and something that I thought was an interesting, just kind of tidbit reading over this, especially with the factor of it taking thirty eight minutes for this second alert to be shot out. I mean, we're talking a lot about the the problem being that somebody accidentally pressed a button, but I I see a lot of the problem too being that it took so long to rectify. Okay, this was a mistake. Let's make sure people know, and it's because of like social media platforms like Twitter. I mean, that's what you have the governor and all sorts of different representatives reaching out to people through. And as well, like the governor did a Facebook live video all about this kind of situation as soon as it arose. So it's, it's, it kind of speaks to the fact of how our culture has definitely changed in the way we communicate, even like from a, from like a political level down to everybody else. And, and the fact that there needs to be just not just, button redesign in this particular system but also kind of a management of <laughs> when these kind of alerts can be rectified or when the second alert would go out yeah yeah uh i'm, I'm reading more of these testimonies you're thinking oh my gosh are we gonna die is it really a missile headed our way or is it just a test uh 24 year old said uh let's see here yeah i just i can't believe Hawaii is beautiful, but that's not where I want to die. Yeah, there's there's some crazy like things here. Anyway, uh, I I just can't believe we're at a point where Human Factors has not um, held up in in sort of these sort of situations where we need to you know ha- have such a um, important form of communication go out and have it be misinformation. I. Like, I, I can't use any other word other than inexcusable because it's so perfect. Uh, do you have any other closing thoughts on this one, Blake? No, but that's a really good point that you bring up that I didn't even really have crossed my mind is that when we're in such a such another, again, climate where we've got this issue with fake news or fake news stories and all that kind of stuff. It's it's this doesn't help. It doesn't help anybody kind of figure out really what's going on it just shows like flaws in the system and what happens next time something like this happens that may be real are people just going to question it and blow it off and how do they how they react to it changes based on you know what they've experienced in the past so it's just kind of an interesting conundrum not just from like a design perspective but how it affects people's like emotional uh i guess reactions to these kind of alerts yeah. Well, you know what else was this week was CES. So, Blake, uh, why don't you go ahead and take your what 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 are the new fun things coming out of CES this year? Oh, man, there are some super cool ones. I'll tell you what. Um, all right. I was going to talk about the pajamas, but, you know, I don't find them that interesting. But anyway, so. The looks like Engadget gave away a bunch of awards based on some of their polls, some of their editing staff. Um, but my favorite from the list was definitely for best startup, and this come this came for Black Box VR. So Black Box VR is building 
the gym of the future. So they're literally combining with the HTC Vive with its motion tracking controllers and special and it and including some like specially designed workout equipment. And they're turning exercise into literally a video game. Now, I like to be out and about and be in the fresh air and do exercise and things like that. But sometimes if you're on the go or if you just don't have time in between, you know, work and things you got to do at home, this would be a great alternative. Like, obviously, there's the the impact of cost. But I think this is really the future of how people kind of work out either in the office atmosphere and some of the bigger tech companies. It's just a really, I don't know, (laughs) just an awesome application of VR and then. I like seeing the HTC Vive really kind of pushing itself out there because it's had to compete a lot with Oculus. Yeah, I so this would be great for a virtual marathon, I think, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, even even cooler because uh, that would that would be that would be the way you could actually feel like you're you know running through the Death Star or something like that. Look, so there's <clears throat> there's a couple of uh, sort of logistic issues that they're going to have to solve, right? How do you stop somebody who sweats a lot while they work out, which is pretty much everybody? How do you stop that from damaging the hardware that you are strapping yourself into during this? I see that as a very minor problem. You can uh, sort of create uh, these headsets with materials that can withstand that. But more importantly, if, if you're sweating in you know, over by your eyes, because that thing gets hot already. You're going to sweat with your eyes, even especially while you're working out. And if you're jumping and stuff, the the headset will jump up and down with you, so it'll affect your vision. I'm just not quite sure how the logistics of this are going to work without actually sort of anchoring it to the head very securely and also, you know, having some sort of easy release mechanism so they can wipe the inside of this, of the uh, of the headset. Also with this, there. so that's that's why like negativity creeping through. But here's the positive of this, right? If It's very hard to work out in your own home when you are so comfortable with the surroundings, right? Because you can say, well, I can either sit on the couch or I could work out in front of the TV. Which one sounds more enticing? Well, I'm going to sit on the couch. Now, if you can at least get this thing on your head, you are transported to another environment that is not your living room. And that might break down a barrier but again it's just being able to put that helmet on and transport yourself there so i I think this is a really cool interesting story yeah i mean following along with kind of what you were saying with maybe some of the negative aspects the the biggest thing that worries me is when you do strap that headset on if it's gonna really affect the position that your neck's in because for a lot of exercises it really requires you to have kind of like that neutral spine and even if even people that are either lift all the time or go to the gym a bunch and are really aware of their posture. I mean, it's going to change how they're going to have to adjust. So it's just small things like that could over time really affect your body and whatnot. And I agree with you. The sweat problem is going to be a big one, especially since their, their initial plan is to set up an actual gym in San Francisco where people can go in and strap into this workout exercise game. Um, and kind of compete against each other. But like you just talked about, who really wants to put on somebody else's super sweaty headset they just got out of? Um, so a few things to figure out, but I think what, once this is out in the world, they'll really start to get a feel for how to tackle some of these bigger problems. Now, Blake, you brought up another really good point, and I didn't want to spend too much time on this, but I can't resist because you brought up this point where people are going to be maneuvering in this environment, and in traditional sort of workout videos right you you see them on the tv screen now when you have to do a certain stretch or something where you look away you can't necessarily see the tv screen so what they can do is superimpose it in front of you right so that's one way to get around it but more more importantly what's really cool is if you're using the htc vive it has cameras all around your setup so that way it can see what your actual uh body positioning is and What's even cooler is if you're not doing the correct posture, it can show you an outline mapped to your body of where your arms and legs should be for whatever thing you're trying to do. So I'm, I'm just getting really excited over that now. Oh, yeah. I think it, I don't know, man. It's going to be really cool. I, I agree. All right. Well, let's get into the next one here. This one's my pick, and or this one's one of my picks. This one was best innovation or disruptive tech, and that's the Toyota e Palette. And basically what this is is it's a retail store or restaurant that will come to you, 
and it's an autonomous vehicle that can uh, that not only changes the delivery market but also brings an entire shop to you um so food trucks, ride sharing services, there's a lot of uses for this vehicle, uh, all of which kind of take us into the self-driving future. But Toyota kind of shows how technology can affect not only cars, trucks, or buses, but also businesses. Yeah, which is an awesome take on this kind of autonomous vehicle, right? Like it's not just about getting place people from A to B. It's kind of making them aware of your business or what's going on around them, um, which would be awesome, I think, for a lot of smaller businesses. Because I know right around me, the industrial parks are packed with like breweries and craft food places, but it's hard to know any of them actually exist unless you're either Googling them or happen to just drive by the right angle of them. Cause all of these industrial complexes look the same and something like this driving around would be a great way to create buzz around smaller businesses in the area. I mean, of course some of the lar- larger corporate entities would have a lot of, you know, pulse with this, but it just seems like a really innovative idea i mean that's why i guess i won disruptive tech or innovative tech uh, but it's cool to see toyota kind of taking a big step forward as far as not just autonomous vehicles we're trying to support other business through other businesses through these uh vehicles yeah all right let's get into so my next pick here was the htc vive pro obviously it's a vr thing and i'm a vr guy whatever but but basically this is this is uh this is kind of advancing the technology in such a way that's going to make a virtual reality better. It's adding integrated 3D audio, uh more comfortable head strap, dual facing front cameras, uh and then also two mics and also a beefed up resolution. So we're finally getting something that's a little bit higher resolution in the headset. 615 pixels per inch. Um and it's these uh, it's these slow but sure upgrades that are really going to make the difference for VR as a whole in the long run. Just because right now the technology isn't there. We want it to be there so bad and we're operating on what we have. And what we have is okay. It's at a point right now where we can handle it, but it's nowhere near optimal. And it's just exciting to see something like this come out where, oh yes, VR isn't dead. We are still trying to, you know, increase the amount of technology that we have on these things. So I don't know. I'm excited about it. I'm curious to see, see what someone uh, like you, Blake, who doesn't necessarily have a whole lot of experience in VR thinks about something like this, or if it's just a non story for you. Uh, So this one's totally not a non story cuz i'm i like seeing this competition between HTC and Oculus cuz i f- i feel like since Oculus is backed by Facebook they have a lot of money they can throw at the market and come out with products quicker but i i feel like all of these changes especially the integrated 3D audio are really taking a step forward to make a much more um inner not interactive, immersive experience for people uh, cuz between the audio and the two mics i just think that has a will really beef up people feeling like they're actually in an experience. Um, But again, I don't, I don't know enough to know what the difference between the dual facing cameras. I mean, of course, more power in this higher resolution is going to be good, but as far as the effects it's having, I couldn't even speak to that. Better Um, tracking. Yeah. Okay. So better just eye tracking in general. Well, better tracking of your physical environment. So, and if you need to, there's, there's a couple different uses for the dual facing front cameras right so if you have uh better better tracking first of all because your head can then track the objects in the environment and that translates to motion in the virtual environment and also let's say there are many times where you need to interact with your physical environment like let's say a phone rings or something and you need to look for it let's say there's like a physical toggle on the device that actually flips it over um, so that way the feed that you're getting is the front facing cameras that almost acts as kind of a fake eyes. So you can see through th- your headset and like look for things in the physical environment. There's a couple of different applications for it. Those are the ones that I can see personally, um, as well as sort of these augmented reality situations where you like the keyboard story that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Definitely. The only thing that I guess makes me, I'm not really worried. And of course, this is C- CES for 2018. So they're going to show off the big products, right? But again, we're, now we're talking about a version of the Vive called the Vive Pro. So I'm assuming this is going to come with a hefty price tag. Uh, 
which is, again, not going to make it as accessible to a lot of people. But it all really depends on their goals, right? Like, are they just trying to beef up the VR industry towards more of the hardcore people that are interested in it from, like, research perspective and gamers and bigger businesses? Or are they really trying to market it to just an everyday consumer? It, it seems like they're definitely going the, the big route, pushing some of these more intensive updates, even though they say in the article that these are small. Um, but it'll be cool to see how it goes over the next couple of years and see how prices change and how more integrated we see these things in our houses yeah and one other sort of really quick before we go on i know we got a couple more of these but before we go on i just want to mention that they came out with this uh wireless dongle so you can basically walk around wirelessly with your headset it comes with a battery and uh transmits information back and forth from your computer so that way you don't have to be tethered to your computer and that was a big hang up for virtual reality so there's a lot of it's a good year for vr in tech at ces this year so i'm i'm pretty excited myself but uh why don't we get into this next one here <laughs> yeah this one okay so this one made my i won't lie made my heart melt a little bit but if this was the best unexpected product and it's called my special aflac duck so of course you're I when I saw it, I was like, "What in the world is this? This is like an Aflac specific product." But so this is literally a stuffed duck that's designed to support children diagnosed with cancer, and it has features uh, to kind of show kids what's going on during their chemotherapy treatment, as well as kind of like showing them emoji cards, which allows the duck to kind of express the child's emotions for them if they're going through really tough things through chemotherapy like most of us can imagine that's really intense for adults much less children um so it's just a it's it's just cool to see that tech is reaching out reaching into different areas and, and in this case through like a children's toy that's not just a toy but like kind of a companion for people that are struggle or for children who are struggling through chemotherapy yeah that's that's super cool i i just i love seeing a purpose for the Aflac duck, honestly. <laughs> yeah, the best purpose. <laughs> no, too, but right? but honestly, this is this is great. Um, I always like seeing how people design for children, and especially for children that have to go through such traumatic or not traumatic, but uh, such heavy experiences so young. Like it, it's good that we are designing for a wide spectrum of humans, and not just including adults or young adults. We're also including a big part of the population that is the future, which is children. Um, Blake, I'm I'm glad you brought up this next one here. This one's the uh, Head Impact Monitor System, or HIMS. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, this is kind of nuts. So this is basically from Prevent, Bi Prevent Biometrics, and it's a mouth guard that combines sensors with connectivity that can actually improve and save, life, save lives of athletes. So if you are playing some kind of some sport like football or any other kind of like competitive combative sports as well. If you get any kind of severe collision or any kind of like, you know, TBI, it'll, these sensors will try and detect it and alert medical staff on the sidelines immediately. So they can give you the best chance of kind of proper response to these kind of deals, um, which it's, it's hard to know how you, how you can treat any of kind of these really severe concussions or any like kind of severe collision but it's better to be aware of it up front because i think a, a big problem with kind of traumatic brain injury is that it goes a lot of times either undiagnosed and then coupled with that untreated at all so it can really have a big influence over time so putting together things like these mouth guards into athletes everyday wear will really improve kind of their you know quality of life once sports ends for them and also might even help us with diagnosing kind of what we can do for these kind of treatments. Sure, sure. And and the thing that gets me excited too is that presumably these will be running and uh, running live diagnostics and, and have a timestamp whenever one of these injuries or impacts occur. And so if it's synced up with like, let's say cameras on the field or something, you can actually see uh, you know, it'd be great if the technology was integrated such that when you get an impact, it automatically saves that clip and like emails it to a doctor or something, you know, puts it in a file so that way you can review it later. Oh, yeah. I mean, th that way we were also not just helping people immediately, but we're collecting data yeah. to kind of make these trend analyses, kind of like what we're seeing from the uh, all these stories from the apple watch like being able to predict kind of cardiac 
uh, movements and things like that. So this this might help over time really either identify or help identify treatments uh, based off a of brain scan. So it's pretty cool yeah. stuff. Hey, Blake, if uh, we're running up on time, if you had to pick one of these last two, which one would it be? Uh, definitely the drone slash robot. Go for it. All right. So... <laughs> yeah, I knew I, I recognized this name. So Sony's adorable robot dog is definitely back. So this time, I don't I don't know how they say it. I think Ibo? it's like Ibo, Abo. I don't know. But Ibo anyway, so this robot dog is more intelligent, connected, and agile. Uh, so as well as just being like a nice pet companion, that's a robot has an onboard camera. It allows you to actually allows it to act as adorably as a mobile webcam can. So it has more expressive eye features and stuff like that. I don't know. This one just kind of tripped me out that, again, we're going back to this robot dog that Sony had come out with that at first looked like it was, I didn't think they would go anywhere with it. But apparently, based on what's going on at CECS this year, they're really trying to make it like more like a pet and more uh, affectionate looking towards you. Yeah, I I didn't expect this one at all, honestly. <laughs> I know. But they've, nice. been, they've been hard at work on that robot dog. Uh, tech behind the but you know they have to have been if they premiered it at ces like as a, a new iteration right yeah no kidding all right well if you want the full list of stories you can check out in gadgets article um we post those on all of our social media so be sure to go check there all right blake what do we got up next all right so here we go so last week the fda approved the wave a new clinical platform for hospital staff that incorporates an algorithm into predicting and preventing sudden patient death so the wave system works by monitoring patient vital signs and sending alerts to the connected smart devices up to six hours before a patient suffers a potentially fatal heart attack or respiratory failure. The algorithm is called the, I'm going to mess this one, but Vince, Venicia Safety Index, and it tracks the vitals of very sick patients, calculating their risk of falling into an early deterioration phase in which the six to eight hours proceed, which is the six to eight hours preceding a potentially fatal cardiac event. This is the first such algorithm to the to receive FDA approval, but I would assume this is definitely not the last one we're going to see. So this, if anybody remembers the beginning, was the algorithm that would stop death. It doesn't really stop death, but it gives you gives staff and medical doctors a lot more information about like vital based on just vital signs about what could be happening in the next six to eight hours of a patient's life. I love this story because uh, up to this point, um, you know, we haven't really seen algorithms play a role in medical. Uh, you know, we've seen sort of these studies that have kind of said, look, we can we kind of have an idea based on existing data. But this is the one that gets FDA approval. And that's what's so sort of groundbreaking about this is that this kind of opens the floodgates for many other algorithms to come. And... I, you know, it's less about what this, to me at least, the story is less about what the algorithm is, is preventing, hopefully, um, but more about the fact that the FDA is open to certifying algorithms for helping uh, different medical conditions. Yeah, and honestly, I've got a few points down here that I think it's it's how they told the story for the FDA. I mean, obviously, you have to do very, a lot of proof of concept. How is this even working? What's really going on in your algorithm? But I mean, I think they the people who developed the wave system really put some thought into this, like understanding that, okay, there's 400,000 400, people per year that die prematurely in the hospital. And what what they were realizing is, I'm assuming based off of research or maybe this stuff's like all um, documented um, in journals like the one of patient safety. But it literally takes, you know, people about 15 or all of the hospital staff to respond in about 15 minutes when something like like a cardiac event is happening. And this typically apparently takes 10 minutes to even get to the person. And they've got five minutes to save their life. Well, in this case, based on analyzing data from vital signs and being able to give people, you know, six to eight hours of time to intervene. It just, it has such a drastic change in the amount of lives you can save and the amount of time that you have to do it that I think that alone, that alone might have convinced the FDA just to give this a shot. Yeah. It's, it's crazy to me that now we are approving algorithms. Uh, I'm going to move us just a little bit along. Do you have any other closing thoughts on this one? Let's keep going, my man. All right, we got we got time to 
make up for. So really quick, I just want to thank all of our friends over at Engadget, IEEE Spectrum, and Gizmodo for all of our stories this week. If you guys want to follow along, you can follow us all over social media or our Slack to links to the original articles. We post those as we find them, and Slack gets them first. So if that's not incentive, I don't know what is. But let's go ahead and get into our next story, Blake. What do we got? All right, so this one's got just the one I'm not even sure how I feel about. So imagine if you could snap 360-degree photos and video without even holding a camera. That's the promise of the Fit360, a product of Samsung C Labs, the company's creative labs program. So the Fit360 is a 360-degree camcorder you wear around your neck. The idea behind the wearable camcorder is to capture the world around you in an unobtrusive ways. So there are three cameras on the wearable neckband, and each camera is capable of capturing the world in 180 degrees. And all you have to do is press the record button to to see your to record your own experience. Well, the camcorder is also Wi-Fi enabled, so you can share these experiences through live stream, such as on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Now, Nick, I've only got one question for you. Would you wear this, and would you broadcast your experiences to the world? Uh, potentially. If I felt better about myself, maybe. But the 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 reason I put this in our stories this week is because this, this something like this, is going to be the next evolution of the body cam. I'm calling it now. Like, we are going to see this on police officers soon, where we have this 360-degree sort of uh, view of what's going on, so that way you get... All of the surroundings, you don't just get their point of view, you get literally everything, the context of what's going on. Now, this is, if you remember back to a couple weeks ago, this is just one step removed from my 2018 prediction. So I'm actually kind of hoping it goes that way where, you know, we have these on drones and the drones kind of launch from the police vehicles and they record everything. But I, I think this is honestly the next step to body cams and that's the reason why I put it in. But more importantly, would you? wear one of these and record your life i totally would yeah so i've got like a secret passion project that i've always wanted to do which is like a youtube series but i feel like this would be a lot of fun to play with oh i mean gosh, yes, i, I really like your interpretation of it and i think it would be better suited but i would just love to you know i don't know be on a dirt bike flying down a really big hill with one of these on and recording from a bunch of different angles um yeah, but it's a it's a really cool concept. I would love to actually see some video from these. I'm sure there might be some either that you can find on the internet or that could even be linked in the article. Um, I and I like the idea that it's also got Wi-Fi, so you can really you can use this for Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram and all that stuff. Because I, I feel like again, like even if it goes like um, kind of the more police route, like if if that's an option. You know, it, putting a putting like specific, I don't know, maybe tragedies are happening. Like you can see from a policeman's point of view, this is what happened in the scene. I don't know. There's just a lot of different um, ways that it could be used. Um, they, it would be beneficial and fun. Yeah, and it's and one other thing is it's making virtual environments more accessible to people. So these these captured environments, while they're real, when you're looking at them, they're virtual. So it's it's sort of. Um, capturing 360 degree video is making vr it's it's kind of a segue for vr to it's just one more place for vr to kind of grab on and say hey look look at us <laughs> all right blake well why don't we get into our last story of the week I'm, I'm excited over this one curious to see what you think but why don't we get into it all right so fully autonomous cars won't be allowed on the streets until they're safe but how is safe really being defined or what are we what's the qualifying criteria well, the American Automobile Association, or AAA, is trying to figure that out by testing self-driving cars powered by the Torque Robotics Asimov system. The aim is to gather enough information to develop safety criteria that can be used by any company developing these self-driving cars or self-driving technology. A recent AAA stud survey actually found that about 75% of Americans are skeptical about self-driving cars, and the tr and the AAA and AAA hopes that by creating a blueprint for automakers to follow, that they will help to build public trust in the self-driving technology. It man, it surprises me for for some reason. I mean, I maybe it should be this high, but it surprises me that this many people are skeptical about the autonomous vehicles. Maybe it's maybe we've talked about it so much on this show that I just think it's a good idea. We're doing group um, think, Blake. That's what's going on here. Is you and I talk about this every week and think it's a great idea, but. I guess, you know, we're in a bubble. 
Uh, maybe, yeah. But and it, it could be frightening for sure. Um, but the the theme of this article and what makes it so great, I'm assuming this it's similar from your perspective, is we're not just going to say, okay, this car's safe. Somebody, in this case, the nonprofit AAA, is really trying to define criteria that really say the this is what a safe autonomous vehicle looks like these are the criteria you have to meet and it seems like they're gathering a lot of data now i don't really know what the torque robotic system is i just thought it was awesome that it's called nickname asimov um but i'm i like to see that they're trying to like go through a data driven process to really inform these safety criteria yeah the thing that gets me is that we have now an insurance company who is testing these things because now whenever one of their uh one of their uh, uh, customers that's the word I'm looking for whenever one of their customers gets in, gets into an accident then they have this backed up data set that they can then analyze and say well look like in our data set it would have survived the simulation nine times out of ten so is this human error let's go and investigate a little bit more or you know they can run it up against their data and say no nope, that was definitely the automation's problem so I, I just like that they're taking this approach and they're kind of um you know, they're, they're actually testing it themselves, taking it into their own hands because it is going to be an issue. And they're kind of the first insurance company to embrace this where you you can sort of look at data and see what's going on. I don't know how else to put it. Like they, they're the first ones to jump in and really tackle this. And it's exciting. Yeah, it's definitely exciting. And I mean, if who be- well. I don't know if who better than an insurance company is the right thing to say because you never know. Sometimes I worry about bias when it's big corporations oh, that sure. have potentially some financial gain from doing these kind of studies. But, I mean, being able to define where the gray areas are of, okay, let's let's get into the dire consequences here. If somebody dies in a car accident that's being – that was in a self-driving car, whose fault was it? Like being able to determine where those lines are will be very important in the future. And there there's various, you know, lines that'll be not as drastic, but just for argument's sake. I mean, I think it's a it's a really good place to start and I'm glad somebody's doing it. Yeah, I agree. All right, Blake. So are you ready to get to it came from Reddit? Oh, you know I am. It's my favorite part of the show. Okay, Blake. Well we go time here, so I'm gonna have you pick one, two, or three. But while I do that, let me read uh, what this is. So this is, it came from Reddit. This is the part of the show where we search all over Reddit to bring you guys topics that the community is talking about. So this could be UX, human factors, any subreddits, fair game, as long as it relates to the field of human factors and encourages discussion amongst us, the community. So Blake, what do you want? One, two, or three? Well, Nick, so I want to flip the script a little bit and read this one to you because I picked it specifically for you because I feel like you can really help this person. Is oh, that all boy. right? All right. Yeah, it's, I'll try. I'll try. All right, man. So this is number two. So if I want to be a UX designer or human factors practitioner for VR and AR technologies, what should be my first steps? This question comes from Gaucho Ninja. And here's a little bit of an explanation about his question. So right now I'm in an HCI program learning about human-centered design. We don't have any VR AR specific courses, though, so I'll have to learn about the industry independently. I'm interested in the industry, but I have a minimal background in it, and I'm honestly not sure where to start. To people who are working in AR VR right now, what should be what should my learning priorities be? Should I be learning Unity slash C Sharp, or should I focus less on development and more on applying design principles to AR and VR technologies through mockups such as concept sketches, video prototypes, ECT, or should I do be doing something completely different? Thanks in advance for any tips. Uh, love Gaucho Ninja. So, <laughs> I, Nick, I was really excited to hear kind of your thoughts on how people can educate themselves more about AR and VR and what implication that has for both human factors, user experience, or anybody just interested in the field. Sure. So this is a really great question, and I'm glad you posed it to me. So the the first thing I would say is that you're learning about HCD. That's great. Uh, and the fact that you don't have any VR or AR specific courses is okay. The uh, I never had any VR or AR specific training either. Um, I did have I, I did work in a AR v, or a VR lab, so there is that. But what I would say is, if you are near a 
professor or a researcher that actually does research in virtual reality or augmented reality, people aren't going to turn down free work. Let them know that you're interested and show them your credentials and say, you know, I'm a student and I'm interested in this topic. Please, please, please let me work for you. That's one way to do it. If you don't have that luxury, uh, that's okay. You can still get started on a lot of books. Um, it depends on what kind of thing you're interested in for for what kind of books you'd like. I like uh, Infinite Reality. It's a it's a book by Jim Blaskovich and uh, Jeremy Balinson out of Stanford. And, uh, and this book kind of gets into the social psychology of virtual reality and, and kind of how we can use VR as a communications tool. And uh, I found that one really interesting. And, and to kind of tackle your last question here, should you be learning Unity or C sharp, or should you focus less on development and more on de- applying design principles? One thing I would get straight is your cognitive psychology first and foremost, because there's a lot of perceptual issues that go on in uh, inside headsets, especially with augmented reality and virtual reality. You have things like occlusion and uh, layering and all these other concepts um, that you kind of have to tackle as a unique design challenge in virtual reality. So brush up on your cognitive science. Um, I, you know, I, I always, I don't poo poo the, uh, the, the coding skills. They definitely help. I don't have any and I'm doing okay, but I I think it really depends on what kind of job you're going for. If you're looking to be a developer, absolutely focus on those. If you're looking for just kind of a, um, uh, if you want to be a human factors practitioner or user experience designer for virtual reality, which it sounds like you do, I would focus more on the design principles side of things. And uh, there's a couple really great uh, usability heuristics for augmented reality and virtual reality that came out of HFES 2018 this year. If you want to get those, we've posted those in our Slack. So if that's not... Uh, encouragement enough. I don't know what is. So feel free to reach out for any clarifications on those. Uh, hopefully this advice helps. And uh, that's that's pretty much all I got. That's a solid answer, man. I like it. I don't really know that I have much to add because I don't have that much experience with VR, AI, or, or AR and designing for it. But I would pretty much take Nick's route. It sounds like you really want to design for this technology and it's a great place to be at. There's they're like Nick said, I mean, they're just really now coming up with good standardized sets of, you know, design principles that we use. Um, as far as the coding bit, I feel like that's going to just continue to evolve. Something that might be fun for you to do if you're interested in that. And it might actually play into more high fidelity mockups is playing with some of these AR kits that have been dropped. I know Apple has one. Android's got a few. Um, that might be fun to tool around in because it's not as intensive coding wise and it's much more like drag and drop or you can find good libraries um like 3.js is a really great uh vr and ar coding library to use yeah um hey, hey blake but I'm yeah gonna... i would just i do figure out what you want to do and just go learn about it it sounds like you you've got a lot of motivation if you're going to independently learn about this um the only other thing nick didn't mention that i would say totally do especially since you're in an hci program and people really like really like to see that is uh go look for internship opportunities at these industry companies that you are either around you or are close that you can get to i think that'd be a great way for you to break in there yeah that's a great point too blake uh and one other piece that i was going to say that i forgot to was uh you mentioned should you be learning unity well what i would do is combine your brushing up on cognitive science and uh, or psychology as well as build something in a Unity environment. So I actually built a, an optical illusion in a Unity environment uh, using the tools that Unity has for virtual reality headsets and uh, use that for a class project. So there's there's other ways that you can sort of break in and get that experience without having specific classes or uh, labs tailored to it. So there's that. Blake, you have any other closing thoughts or should we round the show out? Let's round this sucker out. All right. Let's get out of here. That's it for today, everyone. Let us know what you guys think of our stories this week. Did you like them? Did you hate them? Let us know. If you have any comments, suggestions, or topics, or news stories that you want us to cover, you can follow us all over social media. You can join join our discussion on the Slack. Uh, Like I said, link is in the show notes. Head on over to the Human Factors Cast LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter at HFactorsPodcast. You can check out our SoundCloud. You can also leave us a comment over there. 
Uh, we always like to hear from you guys. Or send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. If you're feeling like you want to talk to us, that's okay, too. You can leave us a voicemail at 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. You can also support us on our Patreon at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. Be sure to like, subscribe, review us on Apple Podcasts, the Google Play Store, or whatever your favorite podcast directory is. And, of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web. That's humanfactorscast.com. Blake Arnsdorf, thank you for hanging out with me today and talking a lot about VR. I wasn't... <laughs> I didn't expect it to be that VR heavy, but where can our listeners find you if they want to talk about Asimov? Oh, you guys can always find me on Twitter at Don't Panic UX, and you can find me at all times during the day in the Human Factor Slack channel. Please reach out to us. Let us know what you like, what you don't like, what you like to hear more of. Do you want us just to do VR only? Let us know. Come on. Oh, God. Uh, but anyway, have a great Monday night. Thanks. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. We are not going to be changing changing this show to a vir- virtual reality podcast. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, it depends. It depends.